You can change your life and your habits and your skills and your potential by applying yourself. The process, which is gradual and kind of painstaking, right? And it's the same for anything, learning a foreign language, improving your health, starting a YouTube channel or a podcast. It's the same for everything. It's this ladder where you just got to keep going and keep going and building the skill over years and years and slowly things get better. To determine how I look at, at everything I do without, you know, despairing or losing hope or giving up. I've had a very privileged, very happy life. And I'm now working on everything that I can do to pass on the, what I've learned, the things that I know how to do. How can I impact the world in a positive way? That to me is more rewarding than, you know, making a little bit more money or getting a, another little award. Those things don't, don't drive me anymore. What drives me is the, the, the impact on other people on the world. Hello, everyone. This is our second episode here at Foolproof Mastery with Dr. Gil Caravaglio. Gil is one of the best scientific communicators online. He's got an amazing YouTube channel that breaks down nutrition science into an easily understandable way for the general public. Our first episode focused on the nuance of heart disease. We highly recommend you to check it out before watching this one we released the first episode a while back. This episode focuses on common claims made about heart disease and longevity. Gil will explain whether they're fact or fiction. I also ask Gil a few fun questions such as his favorite book and his personal goals in life. Let's dive in. In a few of your videos, I've seen you talk about a few myths. In one of your videos, the myth that a CAC scan of zero means no risk. I want to do a fact or myth section with you, Gil. We'll go through a few questions now together. Fact or myth, only small LDL particles can cause heart disease. Not LDL cholesterol, but rather the LDL particles themselves. They have different sizes. There's the, and then there's different categories that people call the small dense and the large fluffy. And there's all this debate about their health effects. There, there's a couple of lines of evidence that suggested that the smaller particles might be more problematic. Two main lines of evidence, one being mechanistic so experiments, mainly in animal models or cell culture that suggested that they might be more problematic. And then an association in different populations where people who have more smaller particles tend to have higher risk. Now, we always have to be very careful with this type of association. Sometimes it reveals cause and effect. Sometimes it doesn't. It depends on a number of factors. Because the main, the main confounder there is that if you think about it, if you and I have the same level of, of cholesterol that's being transported and I have smaller LDL particles, I'm going to need more of those particles to carry around the same level of fat, right? It's just like you have smaller buses to carry the same passengers, you need more buses. That means that in people who have smaller particles, everything else held equal, they're going to have more of them. And we talked about how the number of these particles is a, is a critical factor for risk. When you look at a population, you say, aha, people who have smaller particles tend to have higher risk. It could be because they have more of them. We have to untangle these two factors, right? This has been done in a number of ways. Statistically, they, they've adjusted for each one and looked at the other. And when you adjust for the number of particles and you look at the, num the size of the particles, it no longer predicts risk. It loses its effect when you adjust for particle number. When you do the opposite, you adjust for particle size, the particle number still retains predictive power. This suggests that it's that the particle number, or rather that the particle size, this, this aspect of are they small or are they large, doesn't itself cause a difference in risk, but it's it's a surrogate, it's a marker of something else. And we know that it is a marker of particle number of ApoB. In general, people who have lower, smaller, smaller particles have higher ApoB. It's a marker of other conditions like obesity and, di and diabetes and other things. There's a couple of more lines of evidence. When you look at genetic studies, same thing. You generally don't see, when you adjust for other confounders, you don't see an effect of particle size on risk. It doesn't seem to be a major determinant of risk. Other, other things, other observations that go along in the same direction. Statins, mostly lower 
large particles, large L, larger LDLs, and less effectively does it lower than smaller LDLs, and yet it very potently reduces risk. It's another argument that the larger the LDLs can't be innocuous, can't be harmless, like a lot of people argue. And finally, familial hypercholesterolemia, which is a, a disease that some people have where they have a, lot, a larger number of particles, and those tend to be of the large kind, of the larger LDL kind, and they have higher risk of, they can have very high risk of cardiovascular disease compared to the, the average pop, the average citizen. The, the, the bottom line here is that the, the, the strongest evidence points to larger particles not being harmless, larger LDL particles, and actually even much, much larger, just to give you kind of a, a broader scope when you when you when we're talking about large versus small LDLs, we're talking about a pretty small difference. It's something like twenty three nanometers of diameter versus twenty eight nanometers. But the VLDLs that we talked about earlier, which are in the same family, are much larger. We're talking about fifty or sixty nanometer all the way to over seventy. And yet VLDLs are atherogenic. 70 nanometers is a, is a cutoff, but under 70 VLDLs that are under 70 nanometers can be atherogenic. So the size really doesn't mean doesn't seem to play a major role there. What's the bottom line? If people insist on on trying to have larger LDL particles, everything else held equal, I don't see a problem. If you if you know a way of increasing the size of your particles that doesn't change anything else, I. That's, I don't see a problem with that. What's probably a misconception is that this is the common question that people ask. People say, my cholesterol and my ApoB are super high, but it seems to be mainly the large particles. Am I safe? This is usually the question I get. And the evidence, unfortunately, the evidence indicates that it's not safe, that larger particles will be atherogenic. The recommendation is to keep your all of these values in the healthy range. ApoB and cholesterol and all these things ideally in the healthy range. Just to remind people the healthy range is ApoB below 80 milligrams per deciliter and LDL cholesterol below 70 milligrams per deciliter. I think under 80, if you, not everybody can, there's genetic differences. Some people, I mean, I have viewers who, who, uh, I mean, they're picture perfect. Like they are, their diet and their lifestyle and their exercise, they're, they're like rock stars. And their cholesterol is still high, right? I mean, genetics, we know this. There are individual differences, and we can't, ne we can't, we can never completely circumvent those. But for, I think that's a that's a good range to shoot for if people have that genetic ability to be under eighty milligrams per deciliter. That's a, I think, is a reasonable range. And if you can't, just the best you do, the best you can. LDL has that got any meaning? Well, in in cardiovascular research, LDL means the, means the lipoprotein, but but you don't you don't usually get a reading of that. There's no test. There's no blood test that is called LDL, right? There is an LDLP, which is the measure which measures the number of those particles, and what people, what everybody sees and has is LDL cholesterol or LDLC, mm -hmm. which is the, con the 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 content of the LDLs. Now, when you say LDL to a to a general audience, 100% of people will know what you're talking about, right? But, but when we're clarifying these, these, these terms, and for someone in this field, they, they might not know, unless there's context, they might not know if you're, they, they'll, they'll, they might assume that you're talking about the particle, not the context okay. of the cholesterol. Next fact or myth, I read that there's been mummies found with atherosclerosis, but then Sometimes I hear people say such as our ancestors, they didn't have heart disease. What's your point of view? Did heart disease exist before the agricultural revolution? I know there are some studies showing, in, like you said, in mummies that have been dissected or, or that have been, been with imaging show, showing atherosclerotic plaque. And in, in some of these populations, it's certainly pre-industrial. And I think there are some that are pre-agricultural even. What we know with, the, I, th I think, with a high degree of certainty is that modern foods in the sense of ultra-processed foods are not required for cardiovascular disease. Do they raise risk? Well, they, they, they're, they're not doing us any favors. But is it absolutely necessary? 
no, you know, we, you could have just eliminating all, all ultra processed foods would would not mean that we completely eradicate the disease. I think it's just the extreme views that we have to be careful and and make sure that they're accurate or not. Completely eliminating ultra processed foods would not guarantee immunity from heart disease. But if you're replacing ultra processed foods with something healthier, you would, in all likelihood, you would be reducing your risk. Just because something is ultra processed doesn't necessarily mean that it will be a risk for heart disease. I think that's that's true in 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 theory, and I think it, with innovation we could. I see no reason why foods couldn't be designed that are as healthy or potentially healthier than the foods than the natural foods we have. This is a, a thought that to many people might seem jarring or hard to grasp or hard to accept. And I could be wrong, but I see no reason why that would be an impossibility. But we're, but of course we're talking science fiction heart disease because it happens in such a late stage of life we've already p passed on our genes most of the time there's no way for natural selection to take place do you see what i'm trying to say i think i think there's probably true some truth to that that in most people unless you have you know just crazy there are extreme examples of familial hypercholesterolemia and there are some extreme examples of kids Toddlers in the most extreme examples having heart attacks, but that's, you know, it's like a very rare. But for most people, the manifestation, heart disease itself, the plaque, will be, an, it's an early event, very early. That can be seen in childhood and even before. But the manifestation, the heart attacks, the strokes, that tends to happen later in life. What you're saying is, I largely agree, is the selection pressure is going to be not, I wouldn't say that it's absent, but it's going to be much milder than something that happens earlier in life and that determines your chances of getting to reproductive age and passing on your genes. If there's something, if there's a factor that, for example, has a pleiotropic effect, right? If the same, if the same food or the same practice or the same factor increased our chances of getting to reproductive age and passing on our genes and then increase the chance of having a heart attack at 60, I have no doubt that would be favored in evolution in terms of that would be adaptive to, to, to seek those foods because your evolutionary goals would be met. But I mean, we're, it's, it's pretty speculative. I actually have a, a paleoanthropologist on the channel on all of this ancestor diets and ev these evolutionary aspects, a specialist in ancestor diets, studies like teeth markings and uh, isotope recordings and all these, these things, and trying to, to figure out what, are, what, are, what early hominins ate. He's going to all these like remote regions, like to the North Pole or something like that. It was really cool, really cool field. For people listening, Gil has a video out every Monday. Please subscribe. You'll learn a lot. Heart disease is a lifelong process, as you've said. We need to tackle it early. The earlier, the better. If we want to be living yeah, longer, that's a great. That's a great point. It's prevention is really the key. The evidence that has mounted on that is overwhelming. The bang for our buck is in prevention, and it's a, it's a progressive disease that gradually builds. And the time of exposure is the critical factor, even more, I would say, than the than the level of 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 the of the risk factors that you're exposed to. That tends to get most of the attention, like how high is your cholesterol, how high how high is your glucose, how high is your blood pressure. Yes, those things are very important, but the length of time you're exposed to those, I would say, is even more important. And absolutely, preventing and handling these risk factors as early as one can, and then making sure that you're exposed to healthy levels, physiological levels as much as possible of these parameters is, I mean, head and shoulders above anything that we have in terms of management later in life. Now, I mean, people think, oh, I'm just going to, you know, if I have a problem later, I'll take a statin or I'll have, yes, those things that are powerful, but it's nowhere near what you can do starting earlier. Next question. Is LDL cholesterol not the problem if someone follows a ketogenic diet? So I had, I had a, card, a cardiologist came on who likes to eat low carb and he eats a low carb diet specifically for him to ask, ask, answer these questions of the, of the low carb. Because a lot of people ask, what if I'm low carb? Does that 
exclude this? Does that exclude that? I mean, we could ask the question about any diet, really. What if I'm low fat? Does, is, is that okay for me to be, you know, hypercholesterolemic or to be diabetic or to be or to, or to smoke if I'm low fat? What if I'm on the Jenny Craig diet? Does that make smoking okay? Like, you're not going to find data to exclude those possibilities. By definition, the evidence is not going to touch on every permutation of factors. The way we work, we work with risk factors is once you have a consistent demonstration of, of an effect of a risk factor, whether it's smoking or cholesterol or glucose, we assume it's going to apply to any context until proven otherwise, until you have a demonstrated exception. And that's, that's exactly with, the, with this cardiologist. Ethan has, is his name. That's what he said. He treats his patients who are on low-carb diets the same. He tries to keep the ApoB in the healthy range the same. The other thing to say is that low carb doesn't necessarily raise your cholesterol. <clears throat> you can even lower your cholesterol. It depends on how you design the diet. It's not the, it's not the, the, the low carb part. It's the type of fats. It's the type of nutrients, right? It's not the quantity of nutrients that as much that determines your cholesterol at ApoB. You could have a, you could have a low carb diet. And actually we covered this with Ethan. He eats a low carb diet that is not very high in the fatty meats and butter that has a substantial amount of fiber, that has a substantial amount of, of unsaturated fats, like polyunsaturated fats, he eats a lot of fish, he eats a, a, a vegetable oil like olive oil. It's possible to do all these, it's possible to have your cake and eat it too. You can be low carb if that's what you want and not have high cholesterol and not have to roll the dice. I mean, if people, some people just wanna risk it, that's their personal decision, I don't think, it's a, I don't think anybody is going to, or I, I would never advise raising your ApoB based on the, the balance of evidence that we have, the consistency of the evidence for ApoB is overwhelming. I would never advise just raising your ApoB and on the off chance that a diet or an ethnicity or a place you live or it happens to be an exception in the future, would not advise it to anyone I care about. That's, and, I don't, and I don't keep mine high. Certainly not on purpose. That would be my that would be my my position on that. In the video, Ethan, I think he actually says he's got clients and the ones who have saturated fat and have no real effect on their LDL cholesterol or their ApoB. He feels less concerned compared to people who will eat some saturated fat and have a greater increase. Similar to dietary cholesterol, a sort of spectrum among people on how saturated fat affects their cholesterol blood levels. There's yeah. always individual variability with anything. And some people might tolerate, you know, a bit more saturated fat. And some people might have, some people unfortunately have bad genetics and their lipids are already not good, even when they have, a, even when they're on a strict diet. So I think what he said makes sense in terms of personalized advice. If you are a, a clinician, you have to personalize for the person in front of you. You have to bear in mind their risk factors, their biomarkers like ApoB. If their ApoB looks good, I don't think it makes sense from a medical standpoint to, to you know, to, to insist on that this person must eat this, that, or the other. I think it, it's, it's reasonable to have more leeway for someone with great lipids than for somebody with much higher risk factors. There's, that's always gonna be the case. And that's the difference between, you know, looking at a study of a population or giving general advice, like dietary guidelines, or if you're uh, if you're making videos for a general population, you have to give kind of the general picture. But when you're a clinician, you have to adapt to the person in front of you and the individual circumstances. Personal preference is a big factor. You can't ignore that. Talking to individual people, it doesn't help them if you give them all the right scientific advice, but they are not going to do it because they hate the foods you recommended. It's completely inconsequential. The trick with all of this, with lifestyle, with the risk factors, is to find a way, not to be picture perfect, but to find a way that's sustainable and enjoyable to you in the long run, right? And that's going to be not exactly the same for different people. People's individual preferences. The next fact or myth, I know you have answered this in one of your videos, but I think it's important we cover this. People with lower LDL cholesterol have higher mortality. You've related this in your video to the obesity paradox. 
When we look at population studies, just looking at the population of a country or a region, it is true that you often see this inverse association, people with lower cholesterol having higher mortality. That's, that's true. The problem is then the interpretation. A lot of times people will jump to the conclusion that, ah, having low cholesterol kills you. That's where we have a logical leap. There's a few ways that you, that you can address this because we know that a number of chronic diseases lower cholesterol. Cancer lowers cholesterol. And we, we even know how. Cancer cells tend to recruit a lot of cholesterol for, for their growth. Infections can lower cholesterol. Liver diseases can lower cholesterol. General frailty and lack of appetite and absorption issues can lower serum cholesterol. A lot of disease states, chronic disease states, can lower cholesterol. That's the biggest confounder there, that a lot of people who are sick and who are in their last five or ten years of life a lot of times have an underlying disease process ongoing that lowers their cholesterol, and th that disease process might be the cause of death. Right? So you see there why we can't assume that it's the cholesterol causing death because you have multiple variables. How do we untangle all of this? There's a number of ways you can do it. One way is you can look at the population study, but look only at people, for example, who are on lipid-lowering medication, people who are on statins. If lowering cholesterol is the cause of death, then the people who, are on this, who have their cholesterol low because they're on the statin should have higher death. If it's something else, those, like those diseases, then they shouldn't maybe have, and they don't. And now studies that look at this, there's one from Denmark that does this analysis, and that uptick of the curve goes away when you look at people on statins, which is completely against the idea that lowering cholesterol raises risk. But you can, have, you can do an even stronger test, which is the the real strong, the strongest test of this hypothesis is to actually do an intervention. You grab people that have high cholesterol, you randomly split them, so it's the best experimental design you can have, and you lower the cholesterol of half of them, and the others stay high. This is a clinical trial, right, with a placebo. The others get a placebo. They don't even know what compound they're on. And then if the lowering of the cholesterol causes death, you should see higher death in the people with lower cholesterol. Well, what you see if you have a large enough study that is statistically powered to pick up a difference in mortality, what you actually see is a lower mortality on the people who have their cholesterol lowered, like in large enough statin trials, or when you pull them together and look at meta-analyses. And when you look at the genetics, it's the same thing. People who are born with those lucky genes with lower cholesterol, lower ApoB, they tend to have less mortality. They tend to live a little longer. The balance of evidence is pointing to that association that you see in a population being a kind of a confounder of the, the, these chronic diseases. And the, the, the example you brought up with the obesity paradox is very similar because you see the same thing if you look at a population studies. You often see that the point of lower, more, lowest mortality is around, I don't know if it's 27 or 28 BMI, overweight, right? And then as the BMI comes down, you actually see mortality going up into the normal range. The, the knee-jerk reaction with that figure would be to say, ah, you want to be overweight. Being normal weight causes you to die, raises your risk of death. Of course, that's not what's going on. What's going on is that most of the population in, West, in Western countries is a little overweight. And a lot of the people who are normal weight lose weight because of disease lose weight because of actually some of those same diseases that lower cholesterol. Cancer, you tend to lose a lot of weight. Different forms of frailty towards the end of life, right? Lower appetite, a lot of these things cause weight loss. And it correlates the weight loss and being lower body weight correlates with mortality. It doesn't mean that being in the normal range of BMI is going to make you, is going to kill you. The two things are very, very similar in that, in that respect. It's easy to be fooled by the graph. Very careful with, with different types of data. A graph can, I mean, we just have to be very careful with the type of experiment that we're looking at or the type of evidence. And sometimes if it's just an observational data, we have to ask additional questions. Does this adjust for confound? Does the balance of evidence support this? Does it go in the same direction? Are there any interventional trials? Sometimes you can't do them, depending on the topic. But are there any RCTs? Are there, is there any genetics? Do those generally go in the same direction? Why, why not? We, you got to ask the, 
some other questions. We can't just go on a, on a uh, spur of the moment. I saw this image of means. That's complicated. And the key thing which you talk about is balance of evidence, because we'll always have outliers. We just have to look to where the evidence is going generally, because otherwise you can always find something to support your opinion. You can, you can always find outliers. There's heterogeneity normally. And some of the heterogeneity is, is explainable. Like for, we talked about saturated fat, for example. Depends on the, the amount that you're eating, depends on what you're replacing it with. Some of these things are understood, right? But in general, you always look at balance of evidence because if you run the same experiment 20 times, there's going to be an outlier. You always want to make sure that, that you're looking at something that's reproducible and that is reflected by the bulk of what we know. That's pretty crucial. A lot of times there's this confusion. Oh, you can find a study to support anything you want. Well, you can find an isolated study that seems to support anything you want. But often when you look into it, it often doesn't. When you look at the methodology and how it's done and what it actually shows. And when you look at the balance of evidence, you certainly can't point it anywhere you want. And there's, I mean, there's levels of uncertainty too. That's, that's, that should be said. With a lot of these things, it's not like, it's never, our, our certainty never quite reaches 100%. And for some things, it's higher than others, depending on how many lines of evidence you have pointing in the same direction, but there's always a level of uncertainty. These are all educated guesses at the end of the day, just like every other decision we make in life, right? Every decision we make on, on a daily basis is never, we never know exactly what's going to happen, but we make them with, with the best data we have, with the best information we have. And science is the same way, except we have more data and we can make more educated choices in general, but there's always a level of inherent uncertainty. That's brilliantly said. We've talked a lot about ApoB. Does ApoB below 50 milligrams per deciliter make you immune to that progression? I would never, now at least, I would never make a categorical statement like that because in medicine, there's always an exception and you might find, you know, someone who's susceptible that even at very low levels, they still get it. But what's very clear from enormous amounts of evidence and different lines of evidence is that when you keep your lipids in a healthy range and your ape will be in a healthy range, first of all, the risk comes down dramatically. There are studies looking at plaque specifically, looking at imaging, and you can stop the growth of plaque by lowering cholesterol and ApoB. That's another st strong and interesting piece of information. For the vast majority of people, if your ApoB is low and if you don't, if you're, if you're, overall healthy, you're either not going to have black or what's more important, it's going to be growing slowly that it's never going to cause a problem in your lifetime. That's the real goal to shoot for. I mean, who cares if I have some black somewhere as long as it never gives me problems, right? What I don't want is to have angina and heart attacks and strokes when I'm 60 or 70. If I have some black, but it grows slowly that I die at 100, hopefully, <laughs> and never get a myocardial infarction before then, that's, you know, that's gold. That's all you, we can shoot for. I would say you, you clearly maximize your chances. Let's, let's put it that way. You maximize your chances by having these risk factors in the, in the healthy range. Is it 100% efficacy in every case ever, every human ever? I don't think we can say that for anything, but this is the best bet. Nothing can be said with certainty. Next one, this is something my dad tells me. He says, you don't want to go to the gym and get big because the heart will stay the same size. You get bigger and it becomes more difficult for you to pump blood around the body. Therefore, you should not try and build the muscle in the gym. I mean, it really depends what we're talking about here. Are we talking like working out and doing resistance training? Are we talking like professional bodybuilding level? It really depends, right? When, we're, when we look at the extreme examples would be like bodybuilding at like the professional level. And there, there, is, there are some, some examples in the literature of heart issues, although it tends to be in the opposite direction. Like the, the heart gets bigger, they get, and they get hypertrophy of the ventricles, for example. The, the muscle gets bigger, not smaller. Or, you know, you, the idea was that it would stay smaller, but the body grows. That's a problem. And what, what, would, what seems to happen 
at least in these cases, it's always grain of salt because these are small, small populations and it's observational, but it seems the heart grows. Now, is that the lifting? Is that the, the drugs? Is that, you know, who knows all these factors? Is, is it the anabolic steroids? Anabolic stars are the number one suspect in these studies. I think that that world has nothing to do with going to the gym and doing resistance training and trying to gain some muscle, which no one in healthcare would ever d- discourage. Now, if you if you get to like Mr. Olympia size, which you can't do naturally anyway, is that going to have some health issues? Maybe, but at a, at the the normal citizen reality level, there's there's no disadvantage to exercise and an endless list of, of, of benefits. As long as, you know, as long as there's no, no underlying injury that you're aggravating or something like that, or the exercise doesn't cause an injury, you've obviously those are, but in general, the resistance training and exercise in general are phenomenal and advised to everyone who can. Great to hear about that. It makes me yeah. much more reassured. <laughs> I, would, I mean, I go to the gym, I, I, I do resistance training. I, I'm not, I'm not a professional bodybuilder, obviously, but, but yeah, I'm not worried about that. If anything, exercise, including resistance training, is likely to increase, to improve, optimize cardiovascular health. Uh, yeah, no, I'm not, not worried about that, short of those extreme examples we talked about. Fasting in terms of either dry fasting or just water fasting, such as during a Ramadan or even intermittent fasting, does that improve heart health? The claim is based on what happens physiologically based on our past. We didn't eat all the time, for example. This is where the claim is based from, that at, we, we would go through periodic moments of starvation. What do you think about this? We've, we've done a fairly extensive literature search on fasting and health effects. It really depends on the context. Clearly, fasting can deliver benefits. There's no question about that. It can help with weight loss. It can help with improving all kinds of biomarkers. It's a totally valid approach to maintaining healthy body weight, you know, to not going overboard on calories. Some people really like it. We have some viewers who love it, who implement it. Other people don't like it. There's no question that it can be useful. There's no question that in some, in some cases, in some people, it can improve health and cardiovascular health. I mean, if you're overweight and you using fasting, you lose some weight. Great. I see no problem with that. The, then another, another kind of a separate question is, is there something special about fasting that everybody needs to do to get this special benefit? Are you leaving these benefits on the table if you're healthy, but you don't fast? And from what I've seen in the literature, doesn't seem to be anything specific, special about fasting. A lot of studies look specifically at restricting fasting versus restricting calories without fasting and matching matching overall calories between the two. The weight loss seems to be about the same. The benefit seems to be about the same across the board. What I would say is if fasting is something you enjoy and if it helps you keep healthy body weight and do it, you know, integrate it. If it's something you don't want to do and don't like and you prefer to uh, keep your calories reasonable in other ways and keep your body weight, I don't intentionally fast, but I am. I pay attention to what I eat, and I exercise. So that's another way to do it. I think from most of the evidence, those are probably equivalent. What about more longer forms of fasting, not intermittent fasting? More like because I saw one paper in the literature. It was like to do with like a five-day dry fast and some like water day fast, rather than just limiting the time window of eating, just doing like a whole day or another day without eating. I know it can be bad for some in terms of their mental health. I've seen studies with alternate day fasting, which is 24 hours, that are like pretty tightly controlled. And it's the same thing that we said before. The fasting itself, the act of fasting itself, separated from how much you're eating, doesn't seem to provide any extra benefit on top of keeping calories reasonable. When it comes to longer, several days or a week or these more extreme forms, there's less literature and it tends to be observational. It's harder to know exactly what's going on there. I've never seen, put it, put it this way, I've never seen compelling evidence of a special benefit of doing that on top of controlling your 
lifestyle in other ways. It's possible. I wouldn't rule it out if it's demonstrated someday that fasting offers you the special benefit. Great. I haven't seen evidence of that. What is, what seems clear is that some people like it. For some people, it works really well because they like to fast, and it's easier for them to cut back on calories or to not eat as much using fasting. And the same thing a, a lot of times for people who are very sick at baseline, overweight, and have all these diseases of, of excess energetic intake, and you're, they're put on these week-long or, you know, these extreme, sometimes it's even longer than that, water fasting, well, you're going to lose a lot of weight. Your, a lot of your markers are going to improve. Your inflammation is going to come down. Your glucose, if it's high, it's going to come down. And you're going to see a lot of improvements when the baseline is not great. And it's a valid approach if done. Those, those longer forms warrant more caution, right? If you're going to do a water fasting for weeks, do it under professional supervision. Don't do that randomly because it could cause problems. But fasting in general is, an, is it a valid approach. Well, the other problem with, with the longer-term fasting might be loose, loss of muscle mass, of, of lean mass, because you, you need a certain – well, you need, a, you need resistance training challenge to your muscles, and you need a certain amount of protein intake to maintain mass, muscle mass. Otherwise, your body just starts shedding that as well. So that's one thing to bear in mind with the fasting, especially prolonged fasting. But those caveats born in mind, I, I think it's a, it's a valid approach. With regards to protein – Protein restriction increases lifespan in flies, I think. You wrote the paper on this. Oh, we, this was be, all, all the way back in grad school. We did, we did a lot of work in fruit flies on different, different conditions and how they have influenced lifespan, longevity. And, and nutrition was one of the things we, we worked on a lot. We would change different diets and, and look at do they live longer, do they live shorter, and how does it change the physiology and all that. In animals, you can control what they eat, like with with a lot of precision, right? You have a lot, you have a lot of experimental control. Uh, in humans, you you have a lot less experimental power. It's always complicated in humans because many factors can change, and you normally the the bulk of the evidence for lifespan in humans is not interventional because it takes long that it's gonna, it's really hard to do. I think grains of salt are always warranted there. It's, it's the vast majority is going to be observational. And so people eating less protein or less types of protein, less more animal protein versus more plant protein are going to have other, other lifestyle differences. And I'm not saying that this, that, that invalidates the studies, but it, we have to be cautious and try to adjust for those statistically or try to look for other lines of evidence, maybe genetics to kind of get mm. a more, more confidence. For the moment, we cannot say that protein restriction in humans will increase lifespan. That's the overall picture. I wouldn't, no, I, I wouldn't, I definitely wouldn't say that. There's observational data in humans looking at protein, and it's mainly not so much the protein per se, but the type of protein. And I wouldn't even, I wouldn't, I don't even buy necessarily that it's the protein itself, but it might be what else is coming with the protein. When studies show that it's oh it's animal protein, animal protein is associated with more mortality, and plant protein would lower. I don't believe necessarily that it's the protein itself. It might be the saturated fat, it might be the fiber, it might be all these the packaging, right? We can't entirely rule out that it could be other factors of life of lifestyle, because people who eat more plant foods, in general, are going to be more health conscious, etc. To some extent, you adjust for that with the with the statistics, with the multivariate analysis, but we, we are never 100% sure. You take all of the information, you kind of, you kind of compile it all, and you, and you go, what's likely to be the case? I think we have genetic, we have, for longevity, I'll say this. We have genetic studies looking at the genetic differences that determine lifespan, and what they generally point to is the same risk factors that we talked about. It's your cardiovascular risk factors. It's your cholesterol and your ApoB. It's your glucose levels. It's your blood pressure. It's the likelihood of smoking. So these things that we've all heard of and that determine the risk of these diseases seems, seems to be what pops out in genetic studies looking at longevity. It's reason 759 to get those things in check. Excellent. A few fun questions. If you had unlimited money and an unlimited time to conduct any trial, what study would you conduct? The problem is often not so much the money 
because to increase experimental control, like you can't run a metabolic ward study for 50 years. It's just not doable. Right? You, can't, you can't house people for that long. But, but it would probably be randomized control trials that are as, as rigorous as possible. So, and by having a lot of money, you could, you, could have, you could have it where you provide the meals. Maybe somebody goes to people's homes and delivers the meals. And that way you can, you can kind of simulate a metabolic ward, but in, in a free-leaving population. And you could do it for, for a longer period of time and with a very large number of people. And you could ask all of these questions in this setting that would be, it would be longer, larger, more rigorous. That would be the goal. And you, you would test if these things that we, if, if the information we have would pan out, you know, if that would validate it. Yeah, that would be kind of the, off the top of my head, would be one way to go. You know, put people on different diets. The number of, 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 of experimental arms would be unlimited, Right. Instead of being limited to two arms or three arms, you could do an, an experiment with 20 experimental arms, 20 different diets, different variations of, of nutrients and different food types and different risk factors at baseline and different genetics and follow them for 15 years, 20 years and provide all the meals and all kinds of experimental control and vi daily visits from the team, right? All these, all these things. Your level of information would be super high and your level of confidence would be highest, higher than ever. That would be mm. like a, in a dream world. I would love to see something to do with like DHA supplementation. There's a, with, with supplements and drugs, it's easier than, than nutrition, a lot easier. But you could, you could, with supplements, you could do it way like super long and you could compare like a bunch of different drugs in parallel. You, the sky's the limit. Which book has influenced you the most in your life? It doesn't have to be medical. Wow, there's many. That's hard. It's like, what's your favorite movie? It's hard to put one at the top. I mean, like, instead of, it's not going to be number one necessarily, but some books that come to mind. When I read The Selfish Gene, I thought that was fascinating. This idea that we're just vehicles for mm. our genes. Everything we do is just to further their propagation, which is complete tools for our genes. That's definitely like a, it changed the way I look at, at, at life, right? That was fascinating. I mean, different works of literature that are not scientific necessarily, novels that have been, you know, I don't know, Tolstoy, stuff that's super cool. Philosophy, reading, I don't know, Nietzsche is super interesting, less maybe applicable to daily life, but super, super fascinating. I mean, it's hard to pit, to point to one. I guess, I guess I pointed to one that was that I remember as being like I read it. I was like, "Wow!" Rarely do I read a book that just changes the way I look at life, right? And Selfish Gene kind of did that, had that effect. But there are many others that had an impact. Things from from applied psychology, one that's called mindset. Things that it looks at this effect of this this idea of the fixed mindset versus the Flexible mindset, I think is what they call it. The idea that you can learn anything. You're not stuck. You can change your life and your habits and your skills and your potential by applying yourself and how that works and the process that that, that involves, which is gradual and kind of painstaking, right? And it's the same for anything, learning a foreign language, improving your health, improving your – starting a YouTube channel or a podcast. It's the same for everything. It's this ladder where you just got to keep going and keep going and building the skill over years and years and slowly things get better. Like that skill set of, of prepared me. I think th those things that determine how I look at, at everything I do without, you know, despairing or losing hope or giving up just this idea that it's not working. Well, you're a beginner right now. Just keep at it. This is supposed to be hard. It's supposed to not work at the beginning. It's that otherwise everybody would be good at this. You're supposed to keep at it for, you're supposed to suck at this for five years. Then things get better. Like mm -hmm. th these types of reframing and rephrasing things, the stories you tell yourself, right? Those are some, some examples. Now you've said that every time you make a new episode, a new video, you try and make it a little bit better. I can see that reflected in your answer. And, and you don't necessarily see the difference from one episode to, a, to a, from one video to another, but and, I, and sometimes what's hard is you don't notice 
you don't, don't necessarily no, notice the, the progression because it's gradual. It's like looking in the mirror. You look the same every day, right? It, you do only see the differences over larger spans of time. But if I go and watch my videos from two years ago, then I notice a difference, right? I'm better at, I'm better at this. I'm better at that. We tend to focus on our weaknesses. We tend to forget about what we already have mastered, and we just focus on what we can't do, and we, we kind of obsess over that. The things that I got better at, I don't think about, but the things that I, I'm still like, ah, I'm still not good at, my delivery could be better. My, I could present this better. I could do that better. Those are the things that we tend to focus on. It's kind of a, in a way, it's a negative, it's a negative focus, but it helps us push forward. What is the meaning of life? according to Gil Carvalho. What a, what a softball, Tim. I don't, I don't think there's an inherent meaning. I don't think there's an, a meaning that is there for everybody. I think you, I think you, you create the meaning in, in your mind. For some people, there is no meaning. And for some, there is. And I think you create it. And you, can, you essentially you convince yourself of the meaning. Or you accept it from someone else. And you accept that as the meaning, as your, as your goal, as a carrot dangling in front of you, right? For me... For the second half of my life, my first half was one thing, and I, and this second half that's kind of starting now is, is a different goal. And I, for me, it's about contribution. It's about giving back. I've had a very privileged, very happy life for the first forty-five years, and I'm I'm now working on everything that I can do to pass on the what I've learned, the things that I know how to do. How can I impact the world in a positive way? That to me is more rewarding than, you know, making a little bit more money or getting a, another little award or, or getting a pat on the back. Those things don't, don't drive me anymore. What drives me is the, the, the impact on other people, on the world, on, you know, can we solve problems? Can we improve things in general? But you certainly have that effect on me. I implement one of your recipes you gave in one of your videos, overnight whole grains. What I do is I, I soak either oats or bulgur, buckwheat, barley. So you just put it for three minutes in the microwave, add some berries on top. Oh, that's it's like oatmeal, but you do it with any, any whole grain. Whole grains, it's, it's unfortunate that whole grains have just overwhelming amounts of evidence behind them. They are sparsely consumed in the Western world. It's, it's crazy, and they have a bad reputation on the Internet. It's unfortunate that the evidence is at odds with, oftentimes with public perception, at least in some circles on the Internet, and with consumption. It's rare. People consume all kinds of refined grains and refined carbohydrates, but actual whole grains is it's a rarity. Can't, can't, uh, they, they need a, a better marketing team, whole grains do. I do that every morning, three minutes in the microwave, but it doesn't really work with millet and, and quinoa. I've gone through all the whole grains. I do a lot of oatmeal and I do other whole grains. It works. It's, find, it's finding the things that you enjoy, really. People can connect with you on Twitter, on YouTube. Unfortunately, I don't know why you're not on Instagram. I think Instagram needs someone like you on there. People have asked me to get on there. I've dragged my feet to do it just because I think I already spent too much time on social media and on, on in front of a screen and I'm trying to to moderate that but I am I am open to getting on at some point I, I'll probably have to scale back Twitter or something like that but, but the YouTube is nutrition made simple the the Twitter handle is at nutrition made s3 we'll have a Facebook page if you if you search nutrition made simple on Facebook you'll find our, our page and uh, maybe one day I'll get on Instagram. You always say we, is there someone behind you in the scenes who helps you out? There's always, there's always people that, nothing in life is a complete individual effort in a vacuum. A lot of what I do has feedback, has, I mean, t sometimes technical help, but even even the, sci the scientific side, you know, I, it would never be the same if I were doing this alone in an island. You know, there's, there's all kinds of people that give me feedback. There's guests. Now it, we're at the point where about uh, maybe a third to half of our videos are interviews with, with different scientists in different fields. So it's clearly not something that I'm doing alone. It's just, this isn't mm. like a, a team effort. And I have all kinds of colleagues that I, I fact check things with them. I, 
I go to them with an idea and I, and I, sometimes I run the video before release through different scientists and I go like, can you, can you try to poke holes in this? Is, is this robust? Is there better evidence we can show? Like we try to do all that. And, and the viewers, the comments and the feedback from the viewers are absolute. This is like a dialogue, right? It's not a monologue. Without the, the feedback from the viewers, this, isn't, this doesn't exist because the point is not for them to hear what I think. The point is for me to pr provide content that helps with what they are interested in. It only makes sense as a dialogue. And you edit your own videos as well? Uh, I'm still editing my own videos. I've, I've talked to people about them editing their own editing, editing about getting somebody in outsourcing. I still have the editing part. I still haven't been able to, to let go of the baby, but I probably will at some point. I don't know how many scientists there are out there who know how to edit videos on YouTube. I learned the hard way. If you go look at the first ones, you'll understand <laughs> that there's been a process, but I, I'm just, it's still very rough. I'm not, I'm not an editor. It's still just, I can, I can do the basics of editing, but it's not sophisticated. It's not, but I think people are pretty forgiving because it's a science video. It's a dude talking about science. They don't expect professional effects or all kinds of fancy mm. stuff, but I, I, at some point I'll have to do it. And it's, it'll free up a little bit of time that I can invest in other aspects of the, of the video. Perfect. But well, thanks Gil for coming on here, giving lots of very actionable tips people can put into practice. I think you're making a real big change in the space, really providing information, which is clear and not confusing for the listeners. They know what to do in a, how to live a healthy life. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for the feedback. And I'm glad, I'm glad it helps because that's the goal at the end of the day. I'm a big fan. Take care and have a great rest of the day. All right. Thanks a lot, Patrick. Thanks a lot for tuning in. You can support Foolproof Mastery in a number of ways. First of all, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and leave a review on Apple Podcasts with an honest opinion of what you think. Leave plenty of comments on YouTube and share with your friends, family and colleagues if you feel that you have learned something new in order to keep on getting the knowledge out to as many people as possible. Finally, keep on living every day to the maximum and see you next time for another episode. Ciao.